Okay, guys, so today we'll be talking about compartment syndrome. So today we'll be addressing compartment syndrome, what it is, um, the anatomy of the various compartments in the limbs, uh, clinical features of compartment syndrome, common fractures leading to compartment syndrome, pathophysiology, uh, management, um, and final outcomes. So muscle groups of the limbs are divided into components formed by unyielding fascial membranes. And compartment syndrome occurs when the pressure within one of the body's anatomical compartments exceeds that of the arterial pressure gradient and results in insufficient blood supply to the tissue within that space. So today we'll be talking about acute compartment syndrome and that develops most commonly after severe injury, often involving long bones. So fractures account for 75% of acute compartment syndrome. And it's more seen more often in men um, less than 35 years old um, with a greater muscle mass. So there are kind of two types of compartment syndrome. Um, we won't be addressing chronic compartment syndrome today, but we'll be considering acute compartment syndrome. Um, and so long bone fracture accounts for 75% of the cases of ACS, um, and the risk increases with a comminuted fracture. The tibia is the most commonly involved bone, um, but bones of the forearm are also um, very common as well. And in the pediatric population, um, supracondylar fractures are a common cause of um, ACS. Um, also, with treating fractures themselves, both open and closed treatment um, can increase compartment pressure and increase the risk for ACS. Also, constrictive casts um, can cause ACS um, and any orthopedic pre procedure which is longer in duration um, confers a risk of developing ACS. Um, there are also a my myriad of, num um, of other causes which don't involve um, uh, necessarily fracture uh, and these include kind of direct trauma so crush injuries um, but also other kind of injuries as well such as thermal burns constricted bandages uh, trauma high pressure injection um, and in some cases animal stings so considering the compartments of the lower leg the lower leg has four compartments uh, and the anterior compartment is the most common site for um, acute compartment syndrome this contains the anterior tibial artery and the deep perineal nerve. So signs of ACS can include uh, loss of sensation uh, between the first and second toes and weakness of dorsiflexion um, conferring with injury to the deep perineal nerve. The lateral compartment con contains the superficial perineal nerve and branches of the anterior tibial artery. The superficial posterior compartment um, contains muscles of plantar flexion. Uh, however, this is the least likely to develop ACS in the lower leg. And the deep posterior contains the posterior tibial artery, fibular artery, and tibial nerve. Um, so signs of ACS here can include plantar hypesthesia, weakness of toe flexion, and pain with passive extension of the toes. Compartments in the thigh. ACS does rarely develop in the thigh. However, in the situation of major trauma, it may do so. There are three major compartments. These are the anterior, posterior, and medial. The anterior contains the knee extensors, the saphenous nerve, and femoral artery. Posterior contains the knee flexors and sciatic nerve. Medial contains the hip abductors and obturator nerve. Compartments of the arm. So the upper arm, these has two large compartments and these compartments uh, tolerate relatively large fluid volumes. So it's uncommon to see ACS in this, in this uh, region. Uh, so these compartments are the anterior, which contains the elbow flexor muscles and the ulnar and median nerves. Uh, and then the posterior compartment, which contains the elbow extensor muscles and radial nerve. Forearm, so uh, this is one of the most commonly affected sites in ACS, has four compartments, deep volar, um, and this usually develops the highest interstitial pressures. Um, so the flexor digitorum profundus and flexor pollicis longus muscles are most often affected. There's the superficial volar as well, as well as a dorsal and mobile wad compartment. So the most frequently um, common injuries to cause ACS in the forearm, as noted, are supracondylar humeral fractures in children and distal radius fractures in adults. The foot contains nine compartments, medial, superficial, adductor, and four separate interossea, interosseous compartments, as well as a central and a lateral. The hand has 10 compartments, an adductor pollicis, thena, hyperthena, three volar interossei compartments, four do dorsal interossei compartments. So clinical features, symptoms are pain out of proportion to apparent injury. This is an early and relatively sensitive and common finding. 
uh, persistent deep ache or burning pain and paresthesias over the site um, of acute compartment syndrome. Um, signs, uh, we'll talk about the five P's in a second, um, but a lot of these signs have relatively low sensitivity and specificity. Um, they're important to be aware of things such as a tense compartment with a firm wood like feeling. So these are some high risk fractures for acute compartment syndrome. On the left, you'll see the supracondylar um, uh, pediatric humeral fracture. Um, the forearm fracture, both bones, is commonly indicated in a ACS, um, distal radius fracture, and a tibial diaphyseal fracture. Um, that is the most common fracture leading to acute compartment syndrome in adults. So as noted, the five Ps, pain is the, is, only pain is commonly associated with compartment syndrome, uh, especially in the early stages. Uh, and as noted, out of proportion uh, to injury is an early and sensitive sign. Uh, pallor, pulses, paresthesias, and poikilothermia, so change in temperature, um, the limb being cooler. These are poor, have poor sensi sensitivity and specificity for ACS. So in terms of evaluating, there is limited accuracy of the physical exam. Um, so the diagnosis must be made based on clinical findings um, and if possible, measuring compartment pressures. Uh, blood work should be additional, um, but shouldn't be used solely in diagnosis. Um, as ACS further develops, you can see um, rising creatinine kinase uh, and myoglobinuria can develop within four hours. So direct measurement techniques are the gold standard. Uh, and this is basically putting the needle in to measure the, uh, the pressure within the compartment. Normal pressure of the compartment sits between zero and eight millimeters of mercury. Capillary blood flow becomes impaired when the pressure approaches 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury um, close to the mean arterial pressure. And this is around when pain will occur between 20 to 30. An ischemia of the tissue uh, and inadequate perfusion is occurring when the tissue pressures approach the diastolic pressure. So considering the pathophysiology is important, um, the arteriovenous pressure gradient theory is the most widely accepted in ACS. And this basically follows that there is increased compartment pressure, usually following trauma. This narrows the AV pressure gradient, so between the arterial and the venous um, pressure. And this has results in decreased capillary blood flow and venous drainage. This contributes to a further rise in compartment pressure. Subsequently, there's cellular anoxia and muscle oxygenation decreases as the pressures approach mean arterial pressure. And this vicious positive feedback cycle results in necrosis of muscle and the damage is typically irreversible within four to eight hours. So it is an emergency. Here's another schematic showing that kind of positive feedback loop um, and it's important to kind of consider. So managing ACS. Um, initially, you need urgent orthopedic surgical input um, as time is of the essence. Initial, initial management includes removing any pressure on the compartment, placing the limb level with the heart. Um, if you elevate the limb above the heart, you may worsen that AV pressure gradient. Analgesia and supplemental O2 and IV fluids, especially in hypotensive. Some studies have reported that hypotensive patients have worse outcomes with ACS as there's less of a pressure gradient. Surgical management is the definitive management for um, acute uh, compartment syndrome, and this is done with a fasciotomy. Uh, delaying the fasciotomy increased morbidity, including the need for amputation. Um, however, this is not indicated if the muscle was already fully necrotic or a delayed presentation beyond a time frame. So the fasciotomy is performed by a surgical incision with a complete release of all fascial layers, uh, aiming to debride the necrotic tissue whilst preserving any viable ne neurovascular structures. So there is a question um, and debate around when to do a fasciotomy. Um, one tool which has become um, uh, more common is a delta pressure, which is basically measuring the diastolic blood pressure and mi minusing the measured compartment pressure. So an ACS delta pressure of less than 20 to 30 indicates, uh, indicates a narrowing AV pressure gradient. And so there's an urgent need for a fasciotomy. Um, multiple studies have shown that ACS delta pressures of greater than 30 to 40 millimeters mercury are unlikely needing fasciotomy. Um, however, it's important to consider trends in um, measuring the pressure um, and kind of observing for a prolonged period of time. So there are a number of outcomes from uh, acute compartment syndrome. Um, Myon necrosis and subsequent muscle fibrosis is common if left untreated, and there are some irreversible ischemic outcomes. 
Um, two that are commonly seen uh, in poorer outcomes are foot drop, uh, in the, which can occur um, with the tibial diaphyseal fractures. Uh, and this is kind of damage uh, injury to the deep perineal nerve, um, which will result in the foot drop. Volkmann's contracture uh, can be seen occasionally with pediatric supracondylar fractures if left untreated. Uh, so compression of the brachial artery exacerbates the muscle ischemia uh, and the flexor muscles will become fibrotic and contracted um, with subsequent wasting. So finally, further outcomes to consider following the fasciotomy uh, are things like skin grafting may be required. Uh, there can be permanent contracture, sensory deficits, paralysis, infection, fracture non-union, uh, gangrene, possible limb amputation, and even death. Some medical considerations during treatment, um, rhabdomyolysis, myoglobinuria from rapid muscle breakdown, and a possible uh, acute renal failure requiring dialysis. Uh, a final point to note is reperfusion syndrome. So following uh, treatment, either with fasciotomy or release, um, there can be an influx of myoglobin and potassium into the circulation, uh, which can result in hyperkalemia, acidosis, acute kidney, kidney injury, and shock. So this should be monitored during any treatment.